The master classes at the Music Academy of the West are really unique. It's an unusual performance and teaching environment all wrapped into one. Uh, at so many master classes across the planet, you have uh, an instrumentalist or singer on stage and then a teacher working with that individual. And the audience or the people viewing it are usually, uh, in my case, other clarinet players, a room full of clarinet players. So we get very technical and we talk about all sorts of uh, very clarinetistic uh, ideas. And that's great. But what's unique about the Music Academy of the West and the way that I like to do the master classes is that we have an audience that is an audience filled with amazing arts patrons that they know classical music and they love classical music. And they are there to be part of this experience. When I'm working with my students in this master class uh, at the Music Academy, we work on the aspects of performance that you could only experience when there's an audience. Things like what happens when you're nervous? Uh, how do you really make a phrase convincing? And not just for uh, the sake of what's good for the music, but so that the audience can really feel the connection with the artist and vice versa. I try to get the artist on the stage, the clarinetist on the stage, to connect with the audience. They feel the need, they feel that this audience uh, uh, is wanting them to do well. So it makes an unusual and unique and incredible learning environment for, for the students here at the Music Academy of the West. Uh, our next performer is a uh, young lady, Kanaki. You're going to have to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Natalie Poe, and I will be a senior this coming autumn at the Colvin Conservatory of Music, where I study with Yehuda Gilad. I will be performing the first two movements, well, the exposition of the first movement and a little bit of the second movement of Mozart's Clarinet Concerto. It was written in 1791 for Anton Stadler, shortly before Mozart's death. Um, the first movement is rather lively and joyful, and it's followed by a nostalgic and really quite sad second movement. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. And like the Brahms Quintet, the Mozart Clarinet Concerto can never be fully learned, because every time I come back to this piece, I discover new things in, in the melodies. So thank you. And who are you playing with? I'm playing with Natasha Kislenko. <laughs> I've been enjoying, I've been enjoying uh, Natalie's playing so much this summer. And last week uh, we did something because she's moving around in an unusual way. She was bending and dipping at her knees constantly. And you've stopped this in one week. But now you're doing a little bit of the, uh, um, uh, what is it, Rainbird? That's what I'll call it, Rainbird. You know, <laughs> so you're doing a little bit like this, a little bit over here. A little bit like that. So I love that you're not bending your knees. Paul, do we have, do we have uh, the training wheels for? 
<laughs> Terrific. OK, we're going to do this again in a new way. Great. And if I could get two stands. Actually, just one. Well, yeah, two stands would be great. So last week, I had Natalie. And it cured her. And she sounded beautiful. And why is it, why is it important? Is because uh, she was showing the phrase through her knees. And she was doing the moguls last week. She was going like this. And it was, she's playing beautifully, but all of her expression was coming uh, through her energy in her knees. So it was expression through dancing. And that's not always good. So she's stopped that, but now she's doing the rainbird, going side to side. So try get on your knees on this piano bench. And so you can see. Yeah. <laughs> So this way, she can't bend at her knees because that's just that. And then, yeah, we're going to put stands on either side. There we go. So I don't want her to not move at all, but I don't want it to be a nervous movement. And it has to be, and we're, you're on stage, we all get nervous. It's part of what we do, and this is how you get comfortable with it and how you deal with it. I do it by making lots of hand gestures like this, as you see. That's how my nerves come out. So I'll not use that hand anymore. <laughs> we want you to make the expression through the clarinet, and I know this is going to be great. And don't worry, if you hit this, it's not going to break your clarinet. It's, it's nice plastic. It's gentle. And focus on making the shape of the phrase. Let all of that energy, now it's going side to side, that's been captured from your knees. Make it from, from your side to side motion to your entire diaphragm and abdomen, all your abs working to make the sound to make the air. clarinet players, we play this uh, from a young age, over and over and over and over and over and over again. And every clarinet player says, well, on this note, you need to take a little more time on this moment. And on this note, you have to play it short and clipped. And this note, you have to put the rest. And you have so many cooks in the kitchen that, that it pollutes our mind. Uh, and it's very good, but I need to hear more shape without you thinking about, what did you write here? More articulate. She's got little arrows going to this note. Got an arrow going that way. You got a zero with a little squiggle that goes up. I see MF owing, flowing, flowing. Um, subdivide back, espressivo, a letter T, an arrow going that way. Two hairpins going like this. Uh, extra legato, where it's always written. Another crescendo, a zero, up. She wrote another little zero. Oh, another little T, and then two dashes. And that's all in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bars. So, but how do you get rid of that? Because that's what we learned from, from a young age. Uh, I had a great teacher, and he didn't ever teach me like that. Uh, but I would go and play for other people for lessons during the summer, and they'd say, well, maybe put a little T here. And then before I knew it, by the time I was, well, how old are you? Young. 20-something young, that I had my music written up with everybody else's ideas and instructions. So I want you to think of this. Uh, and I, I, I just you make a melody. I came up with this in the spring because I was getting so tired of hearing bad Mozart. I'm thinking, how can I explain this better? Uh, use the words, daisies are growing in my yard. That's, that's what I think my lyrics for this are. Trademark, patent, Richie Hawley, track, patent. Daisies are growing in the yard. So sing. You're going to have to sing now. Where's the microphone? Yes. <laughs> daisies. Well, isn't that what um, Hal Computer said when he got rebooted? Daisy, Daisy. That's a movie before your time, 2001. <laughs> so, uh, but seriously, sing. Daisies are growing in my yard. And that's the perfect shape. It doesn't have to be more fancy than that. You don't need to go, a little air here, in the tongue. Daisies are growing in my yard. 
Do you, do you think when, when Mozart wrote this, he was thinking about putting a little crescendo here and a little zero there and the sound going up? No, this was, this was a blip in his mind, this little melody. That's the, the theme for the first movement. So try it. Daisies are growing in the yard. My yard? Your yard, my yard, anybody's yard. Don't be worried, it's just going out over to New Zealand right now. <laughs> it's going up to a satellite, your voice, and beaming down across the Pacific Ocean, 8,000 miles away. Daisies are growing in my yard. More shake. Days, daisies are growing in my yard. Daisies are growing in my yard. Almost. Now here, give me a clarinet. And this has to, this is turning into a vocal master class. <clears throat> Give me a gesture with this because it has to be daisies, not like vaudeville, daisies. <laughs> and certainly we don't want like musical theater hands, daisies. <laughs> but it has to be somewhat operatic. Daisies are, daisies are growing in my yard. Make a difference in the dynamics with all those syllables. Daisies are growing in my yard. Day, do you want to say daisies? No. Daisies, daisies. Daisies are growing in my yard. There you go. Much better. Just think of that and, and write that in your music. So if you go to another client master class, they'll say, what the heck? And you just say, oh, I was at Music Academy with Richie. And they'll say, oh, OK. <laughs> Then you do the thing with the music stands. Yes. Okay. So try it. And really hear that. Days. Really, without the, without the piano, just a big gesture. Days. Ease, mm, gesture forward. Perfect. Absolutely fantastic. It's, it's that simple. And it doesn't take bending your knees. It doesn't take doing Rainbird. It's just getting that sound and that simple shape through, through the clarinet. All right. Let's go through this again. So you notice when you're playing low, and I wanted, you, I wanted you to project down through that register, I was telling you to really hold still, and that was where you were wiggling so much before. So just do it once by yourself and really feel that grounded core feeling. Beautiful, absolutely spectacular. Thank you so much, Natalie. I think we're going to just do one, one more thing with you. Just the opening line from the second movement. I think that would be a beautiful thing to hear you play right now. shape go up and then when you come back in it's going to go up again and more 
It's not just going to go up and down. You're going to make the shape go up. And then more. Okay, so each one's almost tiered in its intensity. because you were just thinking about the shape of the line. Bravo, very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna reset one, and I'll tell you what we're gonna do. Wait a second, John. So John has gotten used to the fact that I make him introduce everything in all these master classes, but there's a new element today, which is, um, he's gotta use a microphone for the first time in his life to, uh, Tell us about what you're going to do. I've used one before, but I'll try not to speak too long. Uh, but have you, have you used one to speak to the internet? No. No, there we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is John, and today I'll be playing with my friends Nikki, Jessica, Danny, and Spencer. And okay, wait, try that again and make sure the mic's up to your mouth. Oh, okay. It's part of it. This is Nikki, Jessica, Danny, and Spencer. And we're really fortunate today to be playing the Brahms clarinet quintet for you. And the reason is, in about 1890, Brahms uh, unofficially decided to stop composing. He just felt basically that he had said everything that he could uh, of substance in his output up to that point, and there was nothing else that he could contribute. But then he met this uh, amazing virtuoso clarinetist named Richard Muhlfeld. And he was just so uh, taken by his playing that it inspired him to write some of his best chamber music, some of the best chamber music that we have for the clarinet. Uh, Muhlfeld was actually originally a violinist, and so that kind of informed his approach to clarinet playing in terms of uh, note shapes and duration of uh, intensity over the course of long phrases, something that we kind of struggle with as wind players that comes, I think, a little bit more naturally to string players. Um, yeah, and so I first became acquainted with this piece when I was in high school, and I've realized since then that playing it is kind of like a life's project. You can never finish the Brahms clarinet quintet. Um, we've been working on it together for about two or three weeks, uh, and we've had a really great time uh, getting to know each other through this piece. So I hope you enjoy our performance. One more question for you, because I always throw curveballs uh, in these master classes. So think quick. Okay. What was your favorite part? We're in the seventh week of the festival. You're all going to get different questions, by the way, so you can't think ahead. What was your favorite part about this summer as we're nearing its end? Um, I would have to say getting to play Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. That was my first time playing that piece, and it's just been one of my favorites um, you know, for most of my life. So Great, terrific. It was a fantastic experience. Good, good. I thought you were going to say, you know, hanging out with me, but... <laughs> A close second. Okay, okay. Uh, take it away. We'll start with the first movement and we'll hop around a little bit. I already coached this group a little bit and I made some suggestions for the first movement, so I, I want to see how they've uh, um, grown over the last couple weeks.
let's go back to the beginning. Uh, a lot of wonderful things here. Uh, it's almost, almost what I would like to hear. And I'm not wanting you to play it like I play it at all, but I, I think that uh, Spencer and Danny, if you could uh, just do one thing. Uh, Spencer, you come in with the syncopated F sharps. Yeah, da, da, right? Mm -hmm. And then Danny come in with a, a B, B natural. So uh, this opening, we have this incredible melody that, that we hear at the front of this piece and also at the very end of this piece. It books in, bookends the piece. And the way it, it is approached at the very beginning sets up the tone for the first two-thirds of the piece. The first two-thirds of the piece are the first two movements. It's staggering that you'd have the first two movements of a piece make up more than half of it. So we have this beautiful we don't know where that's going. It sounds sweet, it sounds sad, but then we hear this intensity with the syncopation. And you both did a diminuendo. And I want you to feel comfortable with that uncomfortable feeling of playing a forte throughout the whole thing. And it's, it's uncomfortable. We, we have this beautiful, sad uh, melody. It's not so much sad as it is it's you know, very introspective. The Brahms was at the end of his life. There's, you can only imagine what, what a poet like Brahms had to say when he came out of retirement to write this piece. What would you say about his life? And it's a very dramatic piece in so many ways. So we have to have that instantly, that sweetness, that bittersweetness of the opening, then followed by the intensity of the viola and then the cello. Because that's going to set up what John did this last time even better. So just do that a couple times. John, don't play yet. If you could really keep it separated. Ja 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 da. Ja da ja ja ja. Keep it going. Good. Now, John, when you come in, I'm going to be your Brahms wingman here. So, <laughs> uh, just for a moment, try this. And, and let them build up that intensity. And then when you come in, you have to breathe in this beautiful smoke that is left from that diminuendo that they're going to make only at the end. So we have this sweetness, bittersweetness. We have this intensity. And then it starts to evaporate, and your sound has to emerge from that. So try this, and then you guys come in, then I'll join you. And as it starts to evaporate, I play my beautiful melody. And then I interchange always. I've been fortunate enough to play this with some wonderful cellists. And it has to be a dialogue that we're, we're saying one statement together. We're saying this one statement together. And we're saying it from Brahms', Brahms heart, from Brahms' life to this audience here. I think that's what makes these master classes so unique at Music Academy is we, we practice the art of communicating to an audience. And we, we can test it out and see what works and what doesn't work. And I, and I felt I didn't feel a connection with Brahms's life to this audience. And that's what, I need to, that's what I need to feel. So opening, bittersweet, this intensity. As it starts to evaporate, then John, you emerge from that. And then the single statement from Brahms that's shared with the cello and the clarinet, and then it passes around, OK? And don't be anxious about waiting, John. Don't be anxious. It feels a little uncomfortable the first time, but just accept it. That it just let the sounds start to dissipate, and then you come out of it. Not softly, but just it's a matter of timing.
sound up. Stop right there and we'll go to the second movement now. Beautiful, John, that was absolutely bravo to you. That was fantastic. <laughs> but it's a big difference. And I can tell because all of a sudden the audience gets quiet. Even the baby gets quiet. <laughs> and it's what we want. You know, nothing tells you whether you're playing music to the highest level as when you can keep an infant entertained. <laughs> And that means that you really connect with the essence of being alive. And if you can make a sound, if you can make a melody, uh, and after all, who wrote the, the Brahms lullaby? <laughs> Sorry, it was one of those. Okay, let's do the second movement. Has to be sweet, always. packs the most emotional wallop of anything in the clarinet repertoire. Uh, if you finish this in tears, then you've done a good job. <laughs> it's true. And if the audience is just gasping for air, then you've got a, done a good job. But before we even get to, to that emotional uh, impact of this and how to present, we have to write, make the right, we have to write, we have to make the right texture of what Brahms wrote. It's not so much what he wrote, but what he was feeling. So let's just hear the, the string sound here. And all the strings you have uh, mutes on. Consordino, correct? Yeah. Beautiful. All right. So I want to make this not that it's any less loud, but it has to be less active. We have to hear this clarinet melody. Just like a human voice. And it's just floating out. And if you're, you're playing, and you're trying to get the right rhythm, so it's sounding dee da dee da dee da dee. It sounds very herky-jerky. So if we take the notiness out of it. Make it so it's not noty. Make it so we, we, you, we take an immersion blender to this cup of Brahms string sound and we turn it into a split pea soup, you know? We have to get rid of all the little peas. Do you know what an immersion blender is? But it, when you have an immersion blender, you take, I use mine for soup. I make soup. I make split pea soup. It's really good split pea soup. Even if you're vegetarian, you wouldn't even notice the little pieces of ham in it. But the trick is you take the split pea soup and you have all the ingredients. You've cooked it for three or four hours. And it's, then you put it in the fridge. And then you think, OK, it's too late. I can't eat it. I didn't realize it was going to take this long to make it. You take it out the next day. You put it on the stove. You cook it more. And then you take an immersion blender. It's a blender that you put into the pot. And it, it, it blends in the pot. And it makes it into this creaminess. And you have all the essence of the peas and the ham and the garlic and the onions, everything is in there, but you can't identify, oh, here's a little pea sticking out. Here's a little piece of ham. And that's what I need from this. It needs to be this just creamy texture. And I'm hearing ding, go, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, OK? And that's even with your mutes on. Come on, guys. Mm -hmm. 
less viola. Beautiful. It's great. Beautiful. Now, John, do this. Play it. Play it with that texture and react. The trick is to react to what that sound is. That's making a great performance, is reacting to it. Because they're reacting to it, and they don't want to hear the clarinet solo just playing the notes. They want to see and hear this voice reacting in the same way that they are. And in a way, you're representing so much by that, those, those three notes. John, when you start this, don't do this. I'm, here, let me sit in your seat. All right. And I want you to stand right here and watch. This is what you're doing. OK? Yes. They're fantastic. They don't need a cue like that. <laughs> okay. what's, your, what's, what's your favorite food? I'm hungry, that's why I'm talking about food. I didn't eat lunch. What's your favorite food? Maybe like steak or something. Steak, maybe like steak? <laughs> Pretty indiscriminate. Okay, let's say, let's say you're having something from a really, really fine French restaurant. Okay. There's a person, his job is, he's called the plater. His job is how to prepare that food and bring it out. Or how, it, how to prepare it so that the waiter can bring it out. The waiter brings it out with, you know, a towel here, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if you go to a really hip new restaurant, all of a sudden you have six waiters descend upon the table for two people and everything's coming all at once. But it's very gentle, you know. And it's elegant. And I, bear, I guarantee they practice that. And it's, you're serving up this beautiful meal and you're going, here! <laughs> you're, you, have you been to any Marilyn Horns master classes? Please say yes. Um, I saw one on YouTube. Okay, YouTube counts since this is streaming. All YouTube is great. So uh, a lot of when you're, when you're a vocalist of any level, you have to breathe in the color of the music. You have to breathe in the sound. You can't, and that's not just for uh, wind instrument. You breathe before you play, right, Mickey? And you have to breathe in the right color of the sound. So the right color of sound is not <laughs> It has to be And with the clarinet. As, you, as you're about to breathe in, you can taste the sound. And you want them to have the exact same experience. And then the sound is going to be different as a result. It's how you serve the sound. It's how you breathe in. It's how you take in the first sound, OK? So play this opening line one more time.
let's go over to the key change. Because what's, inc what's spectacular about this movement is it's uh, ABA. We, have, we start with this theme and we finish with this, this theme. And then in the middle we have something that is so different than anything else that Brahms has written. And uh, we didn't really have a chance to touch on this in your coaching. I just want to spend the last five minutes to, to work on this. So let's do before the key change, um, four bars. What do you have? Poco forte. All right. So what is poco forte? That's the big question. Here, I'm going to give this, this, this to Spencer. What's poco forte? Because Spencer has the great voice. Do <laughs> you want me to answer what poco forte is? Yes. Just a little bit stronger than the previous dynamic, I would say. Yes. Eh. No. No. Danny? It's like a little forte. Poco does mean little. F means forte. It's not a little forte. That's like saying it's a little blue smurf. Eh. A little more forte? A little more forte. Wow, this is really different. Eh. <laughs> you just opt out. I don't think I have another idea. Okay, Mickey's going to opt out. Uh, Brahms wrote a very unique dynamic marking. And uh, poco forte. It's to play, uh, I'm going to summarize it because there's a lot of uh, different interpretation but based upon conversations that Brahms had with his colleagues and musicians that he was working with. It means the character of forte but in a softer dynamic. So it, it, I'm giving you a summary. There's a, some really great quotes you can look on online exactly what it was. But it's, it's a unique to, to Brahms. But it has to have this intensity to it. And so we have to figure out what's this about. It's not screaming forte. You know, rock and roll. It doesn't. And then you wonder, wait, is, this for, is it loud? Is it soft? Why does it have so much energy? It does have to have that energy. But the polka forte adds that in, the intensity to it. So I need the sound that, that the strings are making to be incredibly intense. And not just... That character of forte in a softer dynamic. Try that. Let me hear the strings. And then, John, we got a lot you got to do on this to ramp it up. That's beautiful. Now, I want this so that when we, when we go to the major right here, all of a sudden, the, the, without having to do something gimmicky, that the sound loosens up. So that means it has to be intense before that. Not just
there we go. Now that is a wonderful playground for you. <laughs> but you can't do what you did before, which is you hit the first note and you backed off. This has to be almost a cry. It's a passionate cry for love or hate or whatever, but it's what, you, what, what Brahms is saying. And then he's not saying, okay, I'm gonna play a D natural and then a C sharp and make sure it's really even because I play it with a nice sound and my name is John. <laughs> right? Yes. It has to be So you're playing right now. Let's, let's go. This is John. sound after every time you hit that, those, those downbeats. And it has to be different. So, uh, gypsy. Hungarian gypsy. Have you met a Hungarian gypsy? Not recently. No, but I bet Brahms has. Because don't forget where did Brahms, I know Brahms is German, but where did he live? No, he lived in Vienna. And in that time, what empire was Vienna part of? History? Yes, they all know. So, <laughs> this is the language of, of the, the gypsies at the time. And I, I, you can't say he was like Bartok going out in the countryside with a tape recorder and, and getting folk tunes and then transcribing them. But certainly, Brahms, this was in his ear. So, yeah, gypsy sound with a good quality clarinet sound. See, you don't want to back off that energy right away. You have to keep that intensity that the strings are making in that wonderful polka forte. Right here. 